But I know that there's this beautiful universality of what we have as relates to sport and play. And I think that one of the things that I've come to understand is that a ball can change the world because a ball changed my life. It saved my life. I say that with all sincerity. I know that. I wouldn't be standing in front of you all if it wasn't for sports, if it wasn't for play. But yet, as adults, many times we marginalize it, right? We don't think that it's anything that's that necessary except till the weekends. We find time to play. You all play. Don't have to worry about it. But how do you share that intention with others so that they recognize, especially adults, the value of it? If you're familiar with the National Institute for Play, Dr. Stuart Brown runs that organization. He's phenomenal. He does play research. He's a friend. I'm on his board. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. I love the fact that he has done play research, a play history. Over 20,000 people have been a participant in this research. He says that you can tell from his research that play is as important to you as eating, drinking, or sleeping. Physiologically, if you deprive yourself of playful moments, I love this wonderful medical term, there'll be deleterious effects. Bad things will happen. Yet, adults marginalize it. They don't think it's that important, right? And we're taking it out of youth, right? We're not finding more time to activate our active imagination. I've come to understand that truly, truly circumstances do not dictate someone's destiny. And had I listened to all those haters, one young man in Soweto actually told me that haters are confused admirers. <laughs> I love that, right? That had I listened to that, and had I been swayed by that, then I wouldn't have been having that moment with that amazing luminary. And that little boy that was put on that Greyhound bus was having an audience with him that's changed my life and with others like that. So I know the power of sport and play. I know the power of a dream. I know what it's about when you want to be invested and committed to something. Don't talk about it, be about it. But it really is this moment where you can see the difference in the posture of an adult versus the posture of a child. And many times children have no problem gazing and looking and changing their perspective daily. But adults, because we get locked on a screen many times, we don't change our perspective. We don't look at things with those fresh eyes. We need to get in that habit or always find a way to sustain that. And the way that we do that is to make habits. Do something that is always a device. I actually have one look-up day per week where I spend more time looking up than looking down at a screen. I actually journal what I see so that I get in the habit of the stories around that in these unique moments. But what's wonderful about it is that it literally trains me to shift my gaze, change my perspective, look up, so that when someone's asking me for a new, unique insight, I'm already in the habit of doing that, as opposed to brainstorming session, let's go. That does not ensure nor set you up for success. You have to practice ingenuity. You have to practice creativity. You have to practice being clever, right? You have to have creative confidence. I used to call it at Nike creative swagger. You had to have a little bit of creative swagger. You had to believe that I can come up with an idea, but the only way that you feel that way, just like an athlete, I got to train. I got to practice. I got to get to a point where bring it on as opposed to, oh gosh, please don't call me, please don't call me, please don't call me. Like you're back in high school and you're trying to make yourself small so no one can see you. That's what happens in most brainstorming sessions, if you haven't noticed. Most people are scared to death because they don't have creative confidence. It's our responsibility, especially as leaders, to instill that confidence, but you have to get them ready. Imagine if you kicked off a brainstorming session, you send everybody outside for five minutes, go find something you've never seen before, come back and tell the story. You at least set them up to shift their gaze and to think about things and open up and to get outside, get the blood flowing. It's just a simple little thing, but eyes of a child, eyes of one of that forever curious spirit will serve you well in turning ideas into reality and dream as big as you want because that's what we need, big, audacious, hairy dreams. Now, I've been accused of not having a real job. People have said that, how can you, Kevin, there is no ROI in play. I can't hold you accountable when you talk about play. Well, a friend of mine gave me a wonderful comeback from James Mishner. I think it really is what we all should be striving for. The master in the art of living makes little distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his information and his recreation, his love and his religion. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence, 
leaving others to decide whether he is working or playing. You see, to him, he is always doing both. And shouldn't that be the quest? To blur the lines between our work and our play and find joy in everything. I thank you for your time and your attention and for inviting me. Peace. <laughs>